I will talk about uh, non-commutative uh, Riemann surfaces. So originally uh, there were two talks planned, non-commutative Riemann surfaces one and two, but Joachim Arnlind is now has been talking about um, minimal surfaces. So this I'm alone with this talk and I chose the following subjects. Of course, it's a very uh, broad uh, subject and I picked um, some some of the subject groups maybe um, in the intersection of this uh, of the main themes of this workshop. First part will be about um, hypersurface motions and uh, time harmonic flows. So this uh, is of course a, a very old paper of Jens and and mine. But um, recently we we picked it up because there is are some very some very amusing problems in electrostatics uh, you will see. And um, which, where? Okay, the second part, the I will be talking about um, surfaces in R3 mainly and um, how to make them non commutative. And basically, this will be centered around the third topic, the C algebras, which was joint work with Joachim Arnlind, uh, Jens Hoppe, and um, Shimada. And uh, as also um, Joachim has developed this further recently. Right. Um, okay. For the first topic, um, uh, the ingredients are the following. You um, start with a. So it's sorry for my notations. These are the notations from the paper. And uh, this is a Riemannian manifold. And of dimension m plus 1. And uh, sigma will be just a compact oriented that, uh, manifold dimension m with volume form rho. And uh, uh, we will be talking about embeddings of the surface into n. Embedding. And with such an embedding, you get the outward normal. And you can uh, pull back the metric of the ambient space to the surface. So this is usually called um, GRS. And uh, then you get a, um, the the volume form of this. So, so I in the formulas I will write something um, symbolically square root of G. Okay, so this is the volume on S. And then, um, of course, um, what will be there very often is the quotient of this induced volume form, this which depends on the embedding and this the phi ducial volume form and this is a positive um, function on so a quotient of two volume forms on sigma okay um, so to just make a picture um, you have this embedding space there you have say sigma as a hypersurface, co-dimension one, you have the normal field. And now you want to consider a motion <coughs> of this surface, so along very um, well known, along the normal field. So you want it, uh, the velocity vectors along the normal field. And um, the strength of the velocity is now uh, this you have to choose, is a function of this quotient, of the induced volume. Um, so there is the following differential equation. Uh, dx over dt is equal to alpha of square root d over g rho, so times the normal. So this is the basic, and I forgot to say that alpha is just a positive function defined on an interval 
um, and uh, with non-vanishing derivative. Right, so this is the, the equation we've, we had considered. And um, now, if you want to solve it, it's in generally impossible. It's mean highly nonlinear. The normal expressed in, in the derivatives of, of x is uh, multilinear in general. And um, so, but why is this interesting? Um, there are particular cases. So if you have, say, one case I will not discuss is alpha constant. So this is just, um, then you can solve it. Then you, you, um, you take the geodesic flow, normal, and then the surface moving. So this is some iconal, leads to some iconal equation. Then the important things for um, some physics are this. So this is the Lorentzian membrane. and uh, alpha s in some gauge, the Euclidean membrane. And for us, very important is the case alpha s, the simple case equals to s. So you can see this as a large volume limit, volume limit of this. Mm -hmm. Something special seems to happen when the volume form is equal to the square root of g, when s becomes 1. These cases become degenerate somehow. What's happening there? Yeah, yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, this, this, this thing depends on x, right? So it depends on time. So this is changing all the time. So the but you could choose, choose rho to be. No, no, but it's, it depends on time. Rho is fixed. Yeah, so, so oh, right, yeah. that's, um, okay. Okay, and um, now, and, and this, has, this has been an old idea. We, I think we have not been the ones <coughs> who invented this. So um, at least when I was in the physics department, my colleague Klaus Kiefer, um, who's in general relativity, uh, told me about it, and also uh, Domenico Giolini. So, Sometimes you, when you have hypersurface motions, you can uh, pass to a time function. So you, of course, this is not always possible, but you can imagine for very small time intervals that the the surfaces which emerge there um, will give you a foliation of um, n and in the neighborhood of the initial surface, and then. Um, so you suppose that if you have, say, um, if your x, the solution... It's a different time function of this t. No, time on x. On x. Oh, okay. On m. Whatever. There are two time functions. No, no, no. Time is time. The time function is... Okay. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. So the time variable here, it's a parameter, okay, which exists for some interval we hope. And here the time function, I will abbreviate by tau. Tau, sorry. Okay. So this goes into some um, open subsets of, say, the initial surface. And so you suppose that this is a diffeomorphism. And then you can invert this. Yeah, so the inverse has two components. And the first component is the time function. Okay, right. And now the, the sport is to express this equation by at least f uh, f by uh, the an equation for the time function. And this works. Yeah. So um, there's a theorem. And in particular cases, I think it was known before. So I'm quoting the paper with Jens. 1998, and uh, yeah, the first part is so given uh, given x satisfying this equation, and uh, this say this condition, um, 
I don't know. Yeah. And um, then what do you get for the time function? So they are quite uh, uh, obvious things that this is just the gradient, gradient with respect to this um, embedding metric um, over the norm in the usual sense. And uh, you can also uh, prove that this is 1 over alpha of square root g over rho. This you get by just using that this is an inverse of this. You uh, take the derivative and uh, the you have two equations from the derivative which, which give you this. But then if you derive this equation with respect to the spatial variables, you get a second order equation for, for tau and this is the following. Uh, so this is Laplacian with respect to the metric. Everything is with respect to the metric in embedding space plus another function, beta tilde of tau minus one. Then you get the second covariant derivative of tau evaluated. And this has to be zero. So, so this is a nonlinear non um, PDE for second order PDE for the time function. Okay, that's the first part. Um, you have two functions because you have ratio of alpha divided by this, you have uh, square root of g divided by rho, which is function as well. Oh, yeah, and the, the beta, yeah, I have the beta, sorry, I'm, I forgot. Beta, beta tilde is, of course, a function of alpha, so it's, it's uh, minus z dz of um, log of the inverse function of alpha. So I have, um, it's positive and the derivative is non-zero. Suppose it's in, we suppose it's invertible um, of uh, one over z. So this is the definition of beta theorem. Right. Okay, so. Will I have a, cha a chance to get it back? But <laughs> anyway, um, okay. So and and there is a converse, in some sense. Um, so when alpha equal s, this is beta tilde is one. Yes. Ah, l'école française is toujours correct. Yeah, that's 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 right, and that's the particular case I. I would thank you very much we be talking about. So then you, this equation becomes linear, it's just harmonic. That if, if you suppose that the gradient is non-zero, then it's, it's the harmonic equation. So this, the second part is that, um, so I mean, if tau is a solution of, of this um, nasty equation, then, um, <coughs> Um, and, and, and we suppose that, and suppose this you have to suppose that uh, for all t in a time interval, so tau minus t is diffeomorphic to sigma, yeah, this you have to suppose. If you do this, then finally um, you uh, take the flow, uh, flow of gradient t over gradient t squared, yeah, um, and uh, and uh, x of phi t. Uh, sorry phi t of x zero, so you fix the diffeomorphism um, of phi, so the phi are the variable, say, points here, is um, a solution of the first equation. Okay, um, yeah, here to make it work, um, it's a bit more complicated, this is 
complete, uh, just computation. Here you use Moser's lemma at a certain um, point uh, because you integrate over one surface and you compare the two uh, for two different volume forms. You compare the integrals and then you, um, if they differ, you just uh, uh, um, multiply one by a positive constant and then you know when the integrals are equal then the volume forms are diffeomorphic. This is Moser's lemma. And uh, this we, we use to get this one. Okay, so um, this is just... Um, anyway, but it does, in general it doesn't help much because you have one nonlinear equation, another one linear equation, but um, if you now take um, the the case uh, alpha particular case alpha of s is equal to s if Thibault has already said then beta tilde of s is equal to 1 and you get just that this is time function is harmonic yeah now you have a linear equation and now <laughs> you can um, for certain situations, uh, explicitly solve it. And um, right, um, let's uh, now just to, to get some amusing results. We go into n uh, to R three because I want to uh, be talking about Riemann surfaces. And uh, so this boils down to elementary electrostatics. Yeah, first year, second year physics. So how do you uh, get these these tors? So one of the yeah, the, for instance, if you take a you you define these tors by charges. Yeah, if you have a point charge, and you're looking for equipotential surfaces, okay, charges and equipotential surfaces. So if you have a point charge, you get spheres, concentric spheres. If you have an infinite wire, you get a cylinder, right? And then, this is one exercise, I mean, this because of this exercise in the physics teaching in Freiburg, if you have a uniformly charged um, line element, then you can also compute explicitly the tau, then you get confocal families of ellipsoids. And I give you the, so if these are vectors A and B, yeah, then I give you the formula, which I owe to Jens, I have to say. Well, we had another formula, which is a, was a bit more complicated, but this is quite simple. So you take an, a uniform charge Q. So this is just uh, the distance, which we suppose is, say, non-zero. And then you have a logarithm of, x minus a plus x minus b plus uh, a minus b over x minus a plus x minus b minus a minus b. Yeah? Okay, so explicit formula. Now, suppose you have not only one line element, and, and that's, that's what we... Actually, this was a conjecture in our paper some more than 20 years ago, and we were not able to prove it. And suppose you have now, say, just a bunch of line elements like this with charges, okay? So what is the solution? Very simple. You, you have just, uh, say, over all the edges, you have the sum like this, yeah? And... Um, now the crucial question comes about uh, what will, would be the, the equipotential surfaces here. And of course, in general, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, if you have this thing, if you go far away, it will be some distorted sphere. And what every physicist would immediately say, that it would be trivial to see that if you go very near to it, you would have a Riemann surface of genus Two. Yeah, this seems very plausible, and uh, of course, uh, yeah, that, that's. Uh, and um, in fact, um, I try to to prove this um, 
two years ago, and then I asked a colleague in Mulhouse who did potential theory, so a true analysts, these people don't believe in equations or in inequalities. And, um, and so um, we were able to prove that this particular um, thing is true, that the near surfaces are truly the Riemann surfaces of the genus you want. So more precisely, um, so that's a common project with Jens. Um, <coughs> so it's Nicolas Chevalier. Um, so what you pick, uh, you take a, uh, say a graph made of a graph in R three made up of line elements, and but and you distribute on every line element a constant charge. But you want this to be such that there are several connected components, and on each connected component, the charges have all the same sign. So it's either positive or or negative. Yeah. And <coughs> so. And uh, yeah, that's this is a, a simple case. So it even works for for curves and for some varying charge distributions. But you have to be careful. There are counterexamples. And then there is a there is a, an open neighborhood of of uh, this graph. Okay. So uh, such that uh, for all points in V. The gradient, and this is the, the difficult thing, so the electric field, if you like, is you have a lower bound, which is the, the distance from the graph. Yeah. And this is, I mean, uh, well, perhaps you find a nice argument, but uh, it is easy to bound uh, the electrostatic potential, but it's more difficult to bound the electric field. Of course, the, the electrostatic <coughs> potential, if you approach a charged wire, it will go up. But it... But the thing will stay on. Yeah, uh, yeah sorry. Uh, I, must, uh, we've, uh, I thought of a positively charged, right. But it will in increase or decrease, but uh, you don't know whether there may be saddle points like this. And as a matter of fact, you, you can, if you have some, some uh, mil some di diabolically chosen charge distribution, you can, um, uh, so it's not, not uniformly charged, then you can produce a number of points where the electric field is always zero. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit more, I mean, you have to do a lot of estimates. And uh, so, and the near surfaces, um, so there is, um, so it depends on this uh, neighborhood, of course, Near surfaces are uh, Riemann surfaces. And the genus, so if you just say have something like this, so the genus is equal to the H1 of the graph. Again, so you assume that you don't have, have the same sign of charge. You have to it because it's here you have positive and, and, here negative, and negative. And negative. Yeah, because you want to have the time, you think of the time function. I want to have surfaces yeah. Yeah. at time equals minus infinity. Yeah, so it will concentrate it near one part and negative part. That's right. I mean, I want uh, this should in the end. I mean, the, the picture is you have some surfaces for t equals minus infinity and, yeah. and they develop into surfaces during the time in plus infinity. Ah, yeah, okay. yeah, this is, and I want to have, uh, that's why we took line charges. If you take more extended objects, then um, you, you don't get to minus infinity. The, the potential will be finite. So, and uh, so like, something like this, yeah. And um, so the genus is the, the first homology of the graph, and this is one plus the number of edges Minus the number of vertices. I really mean, I think there are 10 times those minus would go to gamma minus and gamma plus and plus infinity. Because you're going to say the potential is equal to the negative numbers, we will concentrate it in the negative part of the graph. I think. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, 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 of course. If, you, yeah, if, yeah, if the number is, yeah, okay, I should have. Gamma plus minus has to be the if, if your time is, I mean, uh, uh, I forgot to say, if there exists um, tau, ah, so tau, tau plus, sorry, um, tau minus negative, tau plus positive, and for, for all values um, t smaller than this, ah, yeah, then you get the Riemann surfaces here, and for each uh, tau plus, so tau means t is... Uh, surfaces around gamma minus and um, uh, if t is smaller than t minus, etc. Yeah. Okay. Right. So this was, I found this um, rather amusing because, I mean, this is an explicitly solvable model. You get just the sum of these functions. Yeah. So if these quotients are integers, say, yeah, you can even put it into the logarithm and you get a product of rational functions with some, some integer coefficients. And, um, right. and here you can study, so it's explicit and you can study topology change. Yeah? Because you can give the initial, or say the primordial, the big bang topology <laughs> and then the big crunch topology, um, you can give it an, an advance and then just the time function will ev evolve, okay? And just a remark to uh, finish this part. Um, so you may wonder how does the topology uh, changes going on? Yeah, because on the way it's blowing up, it's getting perhaps simpler and then it's going down again. And um, there's a classical theorem. So. I'm not a specialist in this, and I found very little literature on the internet. And, uh, but in an old um, book by Kellogg, Potential Theory, it's I think from the 20s, yeah. Uh, style is, um, yeah, needs uh, to get used to it. But um, you can infer there are just um, at most a countable number, countable number of singular surfaces. Okay, so this is already good news. With a possible accumulation, accumulation at t equals zero. And, ah, uh, so before you ask, the, num the number of charges is equal to zero. This I, I want. If you don't do this, then um, you, you would have a total, everything is compact. Yeah? So that's a finite graph. So this means very far away, you would just, if there was a charge, you would have a sphere, yeah? which co would come as an equi uh, equipotential surfaces running out of infinity. And if you don't like this, I mean, the sphere, you have to make sure that the number of charges is is a zero. So there is nothing, if you go far away, there is, there is um, nothing. So the only non-compact uh, surface is just t equals zero. Right, okay. So you have a number, a countable number of singular surfaces and, and the only accumulation point is at possibly t equals zero. It, I think it would be nice to prove that this is finite in, in case you have these um, uh, line segments uh, for some, but uh, this should be an algebraic question. I am. <coughs> okay, so this was um, first part. Next, um, just talking about some. So, Martin, this this theorem in Kellogg refers to equipotential surfaces. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's it uses that. Equipotential surfaces are outside, the charges are analytic, and you can complexify. And there are uh, theorems from the beginning of the century, in the 20th century, where you have only a finite number of comp com components. And, and so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's funnily expressed, but correct <laughs> as far as I've seen. Okay, now let's, the second part. Um, so just uh, let me, of course, if you, Riemann surfaces is a, is a very, very broad thing. 
and of course you think about all these um, pictures and uh, so G and G is zero and then you the covering spaces are just uh, say C and here you have the upper half plane yeah now in general, these two surfaces are very well understood. You know everything, you can express everything, you can make everything explicit. Yeah? Uh, whereas here, the quotient, the upper half plane is also rather nice, but it's non-compact. And to go down, you need these Fuchsian groups. And just, I mean, I'm not a specialist at all, and I was uh, just looking through the internet. <coughs> the only, th uh, so it is, very hard to find explicit <laughs> matrix representation of these Fuchsian groups. I mean, you get, of course, the presentation, in, and this is classical in generators and relations, but say, in SL2, what are matrices which belong to some Fuchsian groups? The only place I found is a paper by Muskit. I'm just quoting it, um, in 1999, where he gives for genus 2, um, four general four matrices, which have apparently the good uh, uh, properties to, to belong to a Fuchsian group, which produces a surface of genus two. So, I um, mean, you can work with this, prove theorems, but an explicit thing you you wouldn't get. So that's why um, and we chose to to look for surfaces in R three because it's quite. Um, explicit, and so we fix, say, a function, R3R, R, and, uh, and we want to define the surface as just the, the inverse image of zero, so zero a regular var value. Okay. Okay, and then you can express everything, the, the whole geometry of sigma you can express in terms of C. Yeah, so you get uh, tangent spaces, they are just uh, the, the orthogonal space of the, sorry, of the gradient. And um, uh, you get an induced metric by the scalar point. You get, this has a volume form. You get even a complex structure, which is, uh, say, the normal, which is also gradient cross V. And um, so they are, of course, uh, scalar. What you don't get easily is the, the complex coordinates. There you have to go to isothermal coordinates, and then there you have to solve a PDE to do it. And uh, they are not so explicit. But the complex structure as a tensor field is very simple, of course. OK, this is, of course, well known. And uh, uh, what I wanted to advocate is there is, you can take, if you have a symplectic form, you have a Poisson bracket. And the Poisson bracket, as Joachim has already told you, does describe all the geometry. Yeah. Um, but still, the Poisson bracket has a factor 1 over the norm of the gradient of, the, of C, so it may be a bit more difficult. So what you um, may do, t take a Poisson bracket in R3, And of the following form, so two functions of, in, of three arguments is just uh, um, in just like this, and these are called gradient Poisson structures. So anti-symmetry is clear, and Jacobi identity you have to compute. And they have the following nice property that C is a Casimir function. So C is a commutes with everything, okay? And this is very important. So if you just take uh, some algebraic intermezzo, if you have C infinity of R3 and I is just CA, so it's the vanishing ideal. So C times A is equal to all the functions vanishing on the surface. There was a regular value. 
And then you see that uh, C infinity of sigma is isomorphic to A mod I. And so this Poisson structure goes down to the surface. Yeah. Uh, very simple because, I mean, this is a Poisson ideal, if you like. Okay, it's a Poisson manifold. Right, and uh, no. And so um, I will come to this in the, um, in the third point. This part. So Jens' idea was to use this um, Poisson bracket in R3, which is quite, well, I mean, it's, it's uh, rather um, explicit. But um, before, let me give you some um, nice functions, examples to produce uh, surfaces. And uh, one class of functions is of the, the following um, kind. So it's one half z squared plus y squared plus pi of p of x squared minus, minus c over 2. So c is a positive constant. OK. So and p is a polynomial. And it's uh, given in the form. Um, a constant alpha, x squared minus 1, x squared minus g squared, so suppose that g is 1, minus square root of c. Uh, yeah, and uh, alpha is a constant which has to be positive and uh, smaller or equal than the maximum of the polynomial t minus 1 minus g squared for okay so if you take this data then uh, <coughs> c minus 1 over 0 is a Riemann surface of genus g and you can visualize this in the following way so if this is x and y and you have z like this so you have 1 2 minus 1 minus 2 etc. So the surface is like this for g equals 2. Yeah, and here is z. So here are the holes. The holes are situated at the, if you cut the surface with the x-axis, you get exactly these integer points. And the proof is by Morse theory. So you have this uh, function, the x function, and you the Morse function and then you just compute the second derivative of this function and you get um, yeah, the result. So here you get the usual um, definite uh, determinant, uh, positive determinant here, negative determinant. Right. So this is, um, and uh, this will be um, the, the, the functions which, uh, which we will be working, but just for fun, let me give you um, perhaps other functions which we have tried a little bit. They are simpler, but um, for the moment we haven't seen whether this will lead us to nice formulas for uh, the higher genus case. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is um, quite amusing. So you can take the following function, c of x, y, z, is equal to z square minus cosine x minus cosine y. So it's nicely separated. So one function per coordinate. <coughs> and um, this is doubly periodic. Uh, now it's winter, but if you go to the beach, I mean, you, you get these kind of matrices. These, um, so the function looks like two planes. So the uh, zero is a, always zero is a regular value. So you have two planes. So this is the z direction. Infinite planes. 
and they are connected by a regular array of wormholes. Can you imagine this? Yeah, etc. And uh, so this is the surface. So it's like like these uh, matrices you use on the beach. A bit, a bit there. Okay, and now, of course, this is not non-compact. It's too periodic. But what you do is you take um, GAB um, you take this abelian group A and B are integers uh, strictly positive integers and they, they are acting on the space in the xy direction yeah? and if you call this surface sigma tilde yeah, then if you, you can mod out this group, okay, and then you uh, can imagine you get some kind of, it closes and this will be a, a Riemann surface. And you even can compute the genus of this, and this is, um, what was it, AB plus one. Yeah. And of course, this, this uh, sigma here is no longer an R3, but an R cross T2, okay. And uh, I say it again, so here the function is quite simple. Yeah? And you can um, make it even, can take the obvious function cos x plus cos y plus cos z. Um, zero is a regular value. And How do you get the sigma tilde? Oh, sigma tilde is just this equals to zero. This is a this is a, um, a surface, so you prove that the gradient is non-zero on this locus. And the lower surface is the usual plane. No, 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 no. The, the, this is this is connected. This is uh, it was just for drawing. I mean, this is um, you oh. get you get at, at at certain points you get uh, th these are like wormholes. I mean, but it's 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 a regular array like this. Okay. And of course, a bit rounder, just to get the principle. Here, um, if you take this, and this is, I think, a well-known surface. I I've saw it later in a book. So if you take a cube um, like this, then you get a sort of Lego thing, which is like this. Um, and there you connect like this, like this. I hope you can somehow imagine how the surface looks like. Yeah? And then, of course, you, you um, build them together in a, an infinite array. And then if you, if you uh, divide by the obvious group ABC, okay, um, then you will get uh, a compact surface in T3. Okay. And if, if you're dividing by this, yeah. you, you may not get compact because... Uh, no, no, you get compact, yeah, sure. It's compact. It's an infinite group. I mean no, no, it's finite. A times Z plus B times Z. It's, it's an infinite square. group. It's a group of Z squared. It's an infinite group, yeah. So it's, uh, you have R3 modulo, this group is R cross T2. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and here you get T3, yeah. And the genus, the genus formula is amusing. It's just like... What was it? Three ABC um, minus AB minus BC minus CA plus A plus B plus C. Yeah. So if C is equal to one, say this is just the genus is uh, two AB plus one. Yeah. Um, you see this if you take take just <coughs> one block. So A equals B equals C. Then if you identify, you get one handle like this, one handle like this, and one handle like this. These are three handles, and so the genus is equal to three. Right. So, um, yeah. So this is still open. We we try to work with it. We, yeah. Now, non-commutativity. Um, so this just the, the surface. Yeah. Um, right. I wanted to say something about star products. So this is of course um, a usual technique 
for to work also in non-commutative field theory to use star products. And yeah, okay. Uh, so in general, if you have a Poisson manifold, yeah, so P I G F G G G is the the Poisson bracket. Okay, then uh, a star product is written for on two functions of x is a series of bidifferential <coughs> operators, and this is you demand that this is should be associative, very difficult, and mu zero is just the ordinary function uh, product of function, and the uh, first order commutator is uh, should be equal to no we are say i times the Poisson bracket but you can also choose it equal to one non zero okay so um And uh, yeah, of course you have a beautiful general existence and classification theory of these things, thanks to Maxim Konsevich. And you can express star products in terms of graphs where you need weights, which are integral configuration spaces. And um, yeah. Um, so there's this 1997, the famous preprint. And the thing is, so you, everything is done. It exists and you also know this uh, equivalence problem if you have two star products, they are called equivalent if you have a, a differential operator series like this. Um, That's formal power series? Or oh, yes, 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 yes. That's formal power series. And in general, never converging. You have Borel's classical theorem that every formal power series can be uh, made equal to the Taylor series of a function, smooth function with compact support. And so, so it's uh, you can hope that this converges on <coughs> on subalgebra sets, but general, yeah. Um, right. So, um, explicit formulas is difficult. In general, you have only very little. So there's Weil, um, which is say e to the p i j d i f p is constant pi sorry so this you can write it like this and um, the same works on the torus so if a Weyl's product you get some yeah, yeah of course of course yeah yeah pi constant constant if not <laughs> that means this would be <laughs> yeah um, and you, you get some other, so I, I will not write them down. For instance, you get a formula for CPN to advocate one of my early works. So with um, uh, Claudio Emrich and uh, Waldmann. This was in 1996. So there you get a really an explicit formula for CPN. So in particular for the, sphe for the sphere, and it coincides, of course, with all the formulas before. So for S2, you have a lot of things. You have the fuzzy sphere. You have Jens thesis, etc. And also for Harold, this also works for the CP1N. So you get the same formula. It's this Okay, um, also the cotangent bundle of the, the end sphere is also a, um, a format. Right, 
Um, now, what does it help us for the uh, for this case? And um, so, uh, there are a lot of attempts, but they don't um, actually help a lot. So, of course, if you take um, the surface directly, so it's a two-dimensional manifold, and it's symplectic. Yeah, and there you have techniques like Philosoph. Yeah, you you get a symplectic connection, you take the Kähler connection, and then it's expressible in terms of the curvature tensors. But to my best knowledge, I don't know whether you get really something explicit by this. And also you have to, you have the problem to describe the, uh, the surface in some sense. So then you can do it just order by order, because the, the third Hochschild cohomology vanishes here. Yeah, you just uh, say I have my favorite term of n or until order n, it's associative uh, until order n, so I can, it always works. Yeah? And um, if you look at R3 with these um, gradient Poisson structures, then I'd like to quote a very old result of uh, one of my colleagues in Freiburg, so this was his PhD thesis in 1997. And he proved that order by order works, which is already amazing because we are in R3, so the H, uh, the third Hochschild cohomology is not zero, but there's also can be a non vanishing term. And he shows by an ingenious argument, so he constructs um, in the Concevich language. Um, uh, multi differential or poly differential operators which are which can be ordered in such a sense that that the derivatives are, all, are only going down so you don't have circles going up and he <coughs> proves by induction that that finally the order by order argument works so there is there are no obstructions so the uh, statement is for any what c infinity function tau you can construct uh, yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Just to know what is the statement. That that's the statement. No, 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 nothing, nothing. It's just, I mean, c infinity. Yeah, you need derivatives of it. Yeah, that's. And <coughs> but uh, if you do the Konsevich star product, it has the benefit that um, you get an equivalent star product such that c. Um, star commutes with everything. Yeah. This was, I think, stated by Catania Felder. Correct me if I'm... 1999. At least I found uh, where they... And... Uh, the, the, the construction is simple. You get the uh, formality map of... So this is the, the equivalence transformation. I think because this Hochschild homology identified or quantization, it is center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, so so the, I, uh, what I don't know, and so the Poisson center will be in the center of the SAR product, yeah. perhaps also vice versa, but I don't know. This, uh, this I'm... Then, uh, but yeah, I mean, this will be if this is your um, formality map, and you can just. Um, the center actually it's quotient, zero quotient homology control is the same in CSS. It's yeah. HH zero. So yeah, yeah, okay. And so, and I don't know how to do it just without these techniques here. Yeah, and then it, uh, naively, if you just compute the, the first orders, it, it, it's well, it's, it doesn't <laughs> seem to be like this. But so, so what is what is the Konsevich R3? So what ah. C, what is C? You mean C? C is always this function which defines your surface. Yeah? yeah? So it's you have two different views of the, you say, of this C. Uh, yes, I so what are the two different statements? Both of them are a C-based bracket, no? Like a C-based bracket in C's casino, yeah. Yeah. The C is that th this is I'm, I'm only talking about this bracket, the gradient yeah, bracket. Okay, two different statements. Mm -hmm. No, this is about the same. The, so this R three with this star product, yes. yeah, 
you just a, a remark. This can be quantized just as it uh, as uh, you don't need the the conceivage techniques to do it. Yeah, but if you use the conceivage techniques, and uh, an additional bonus is you get C as a quantum Casimir. Yeah, that's the that's the, the statement. Okay. Um, <coughs> Right, and this was, um, yeah, what I wanted to say about, um, yeah, and now, um, very briefly, unfortunately, about these uh, C algebras. Yeah, so coming back so um, to this, to this um, Poisson bracket, then C is not the same C. Uh, I think, if I'm not completely mistaken, then in this talk there are two Cs: one with a with a back, which uh, refers to the complex numbers, and the other C, if I does don't have didn't make a mistake, should always be this function of three variables in R three, including for this C algebra. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So. Are these polynomials still on the blackboard? Yes, here. Yeah. So if you take these polynomials, so you get some, um, the, you can compute the Poisson brackets of the three variables. So this is equal to z. And um, here you get something. You can compute this. OK. Right. And. Um, so Jens' ansatz to quantize is, oh, I mean, he says, OK, let's just replace all the x, y, z by matrices and impose these things as commutation relations. Yeah? So the, if you have, say, x, y is equal to i, h bar, z, etc. Yeah? Etc. is a bit cheating because you may have ordering problems and you will have ordering problems in general. Okay, but the first thing is um, this commutator allows you in some sense to eliminate um, z from... Um, so I will and uh, c equals zero. So what this means more precisely, <laughs> you take say the free algebra in um, so the non-commutative free algebra in three variables, okay, tensor algebra if you like, and you mod out these relations plus c equals zero, yeah. So and c equals zero, okay, and then and find representations, finite-dimensional. Representations. So it, this is, of course, um, it is dared in some sense because you just take the Poisson brackets and impose them as the commutators. I mean, coming from star products, I would say you, have, you would have to add higher orders to make it more consistent. But um, uh, okay, so we tried it, and um, this. It can be said that that it works very well for the genus zero and genus one case, and so you get representations. And uh, so the the theorem is so far and uh, more precisely, um, yeah. So we, ha we took the following C, this one x squared plus y squared minus mu squared plus one half z squared minus one half C, okay? And for mu, uh, if you set this equal to zero, this is a torus. And mu uh, uh, 
it's a sphere. Yeah, so you have the picture of, say, a distorted sphere. And uh, then you get a torus. Okay? And <coughs> so I'm basically. Well, when at I. At the end of the talk, but just take two or three more minutes. Right. So um, let me perhaps just write down the relations you can um, reformulate everything. So you have the matrix W. Yeah, and, v is and you get just uh, cubic relations. So I write just one, the other one is just a Hermitian conjugate. Yeah. Right, so you try, uh, the problem is try to find matrices which obey this, and this works. And I, I just give you the, the form of the matrices and um, So it's a representation, phi of w is equal to 0, and square root of e tilde 1, e tilde n minus 1, and e tilde n. Okay. Um, for, yeah, and then you get conditions you can express this like uh, e tilde l is c mu over square root of c plus co cosine 2l plus beta, so cosine theta. Um, e to the e theta is q, q n is 1. Yeah, basically you have uh, explicit um, Constructions. Uh, this is for C uh, square root of C. So this is the torus case, and for the sphere you get similar matrices. Okay, um, right. And now the last thing, and this was quite. Uh, if I have just one minute, <coughs> so the comparison with uh, Beresian triplets um, quantization works. That's a very good, that's a good <laughs> yeah. No, this means in, in particular, if you, um, for the torus and sphere case, you can parameterize these surfaces. You can actually get a map from the torus, from the usually with two angles or the sphere, round sphere, into these surfaces, and then <coughs> uh, you can do the whole um, Kähler quantization, Beresian triplets business on it, and compare with the matrices you would get for X and Y. And this you can compute, and you get for the torus almost a coincidence, and for the sphere, I think this also is due to the fact that the sphere is not really round, but has this distortion, um, then you you get, um, or say, an asymptotic for, for when n goes to infinity um, coincidence, yeah. So I'm sorry, Beresian triplets, one could say some other words, but I mean, this is okay. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much for the talk, Martin. I just w want to ask some questions or comments. So the, this part, I guess, with the, with the genus, higher genus surfaces is, so to speak, you told us in the quest of, to, 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 I mean, the open problem. That's is, an open problem. The open problem is to find explicitly non 
examples of non-commutative surfaces of higher genus, right? Yeah, and but this is yeah. this is sort yeah. of a, a nice suggestion of you what one could try. To <sighs> and I forgot, of course, to mention um, recent work by Joachim on higher genus for where he found matrices uh, two by two and three by three matrices for each genus, and there's another preprint which, but which I <coughs> didn't understand. Um, by Andreas before Sukora. I make more comments, yes. more okay. questions. Okay. Yes. Other comments. Yeah, no, yeah. other comments. <laughs> it's better from. I, I also I have one or two more comments, but maybe Maxim first. Yeah, okay. Should I have two comments? Yeah, about um, this uh, functions of three variables. People in algebra play. Yeah, we can make some polynomials in three variables, which singularizes A, D, F type. Uh, yeah, to, like mm -hmm. uh, plus x to the power n plus x y square plus z square for n type. And mm -hmm. in E, you get all three variables. When participant can people play with it, and is, is my memory serves well, uh, kind of understand how to quantize it pretty explicitly. And you should do uh, like potential in. Uh, in uh, in free algebra in three variables, uh, some mm -hmm. cyclic word, which is x, y, z minus z, y, x, responsible for commutativity, and plus a little correction for potential. And then, then can see the critical points on matrices will be exactly under dimensional representations. Yeah, so, so you're, you're, you're mm -hmm. describing your matrices, your algebra is uh, like critical ah. points for non commutative potential. Yeah, it's called the algebra. It, it's called. Okay, it's, but what? Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a whole business about this, eight and go off, and yeah, this is. Mm -hmm. Sorry. But what do they get for what kind of surfaces do they get? Uh, no, 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 they can see some examples. Uh, they have singularities, uh, I uh, guess. Uh, yeah, yeah when zero is a singular point, but near by you get some interesting uh, mm -hmm. level sets. And also, I played a little bit with the same question with three variables and uh, like consider some of three squares. Mm -hmm. And when and when we're interested, when we have finite dimensional presentation depending on each bar, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but the dimensions can fix. Mm -hmm. then, then it means that uh, it looks that uh, one can make a conjecture that if you complexify your surface and consider uh, periods of two form divided by each bar, you get half integers. Yeah, so mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it could be open curved space. So there seems to be really nice uh, like quantization conditions one can see from cohomology of mm -hmm. periods of two form on complexification. <coughs> Exactly new singularities, it's interesting. So, yeah. okay. Thanks, Martin. Uh, questions, comments? Douglas is raising his hand. Yeah. Is there something like a lower bound for the uh, matrix dimension in terms of the genus, or can you find the. Um, uh, if you if you are doing, I mean, uh, it's, I, I don't know the formula by heart, but of course, in. in if you do Bayesian triplets quantization, then the, the dimension of the uh, holomorphic section space is, is given by the riemann roch hilzebroch for formula. So this is given. So for, for oh sorry, for um, um, the sphere and the torus, of course, one knows the dimensions very well. It's m plus one for the sphere and m for the for the torus. For a higher genus, I have forgotten, but it's all it's, it's known. You have to take this. Um, bundle of um, holomorphic one forms and it's tensor powers and there's a formula but which I don't know by heart. Well the so reference you mentioned there you find two dimensional representation for arbitrary genus so okay. there is obviously no lower bound. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, you, ah you mean in yeah, the right. paper? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, right sort of no. Yeah. yeah. Um, small uh, questions, comments, so what yeah. happens if you're considering uh, uh, non finitely generated limit surfaces? Like if you're taking this function with the cosines and you're not taking the quotient by this group GID, mm -hmm. uh, do you have any idea if you can get also finite dimensional matrices? Uh, we haven't actually looked at this, and um, my guess is it's non compact, so you may get. Uh, say uh, also the if you do some some Kähler thing, it, the the holomorphic section space I would say is, is are infinite dimensional, <coughs> but I I don't have a real feeling for this, uh, so so I don't know. Ah, George. So uh, concerning the first part of the talk about the fiber surface motions, have you considered the case of 
integrable uh, 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 motion and especially this equation yes, you found the lax pair uh, case where it reduces to an integrable you mean for this time harmonic flow there? Uh, for, for the motion of the, of, the, of, the, of the surface. I don't know if the... Okay. Um, may I answer? Yes, please. Um, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, the, the, there's one... Yes. Uh, Lux bar, no, but infinitely many conserved quantities, yes. And right. it's, uh, it's an example uh, of a diffeomorphism invariant field theory which is integrable. I mean, both by just writing the solutions in, I mean, in, in explicit form, and um, you have infinitely many conserved quantities, and it's quite interesting, it relates different uh, manifolds with uh, similar Ricci tensor, conformally related to each other. There's a lot. It, one comment I wanted to make is um, it's related to Nam equations, and ah, I forgot. so this is, um, I mean, the, the theme of space, time, matrices, it's in your talk we will hear, uh, we will see again the, um, the double commutator equations, and uh, Nam equations also somehow are around, and this, <coughs> this star equation for the case where alpha is linear, is a linear function, uh, where the star equation, as it is, is a set of nonlinear PDEs, um, are, it, are the n going to infinity limit of the norm equations. And uh, that's somewhat interesting. And hey, I forgot to say, so this, yeah. is, this electrostatic model is, say, the GL infinity norm equation in R3. Yeah. So it's in, in some sense integral. You can write down a lot of solutions. Um, I guess we need coffee and some time for prepare for the next talk. And thanks very much, Martin, for telling us lots of things. And uh, let's thank the speaker.